Welcome to the next video on balances as guides towards a sustainable future. Last time we have been discussing about CO2 emissions, how that influences the atmosphere and how that in turn influences the climate. And we have seen that we have roughly 10 to 20 years time to change something in the system because otherwise we will hit the plus 2 degrees centigrade limit. And we have on the other hand side seen that we know actually very little about the system. At least it's my impression as a non-climatologist that there are si still significant effects not really being understood. Today we now would look, like to look at the land area, the bioenergy and nutrition. Well, simply because bioenergy is of course one option. One option to not using fossil resources and by that reducing the CO2 emissions significantly. And that obviously competes then with nutrition. On the other hand side, uh, I would like to show some options for sustainable energy supply in general. Now, as said, nutrition and bioenergy compete with each other. The limiting resource is actually the land area. I would like to give, to give you two references to that. On the one hand side, Miserio, which is a Catholic organization supporting developing nations or people in developing nations, warns against extended use of biofuel, exactly because of this food versus fuel discussion. Actually, this food versus, food versus fuel discussion started already in 2007, where there were riots in Mexico City because the corn price was significantly increasing. And people said actually that was because the United States are using the corn for biofuel production and that's why the price increased. Actually that is not true. Uh, actually the reason was that there was a shift in the taxation system and that led to increasing prices for the export, unfortunately. But nevertheless this opened our eyes that there is some competition between fuel and nutrition. This crisis in Mexico City, these riots were late, later termed the tortilla crisis and this is explicitly also mentioned or is referred to in this um, statement here by the Der Tagesspiegel, threat of a global disaster, exploding prices for food, starvation, bloody riots about food as well as water shortage, dramatic challenges for millions of people. Yeah, so people realized that there was really something going to happen if we don't take care of this problem prob properly. Now let me summarize the, the things again that we have seen already in the beginning where we looked at where we are. And we saw that we are producing plant-based material originally on the land area we use for agricultural purposes of 4,257 kilocalories per capita a day, more than enough for everybody. In the end, at the consumer end, we only have 2,330 kilocalories per day and capita. So significantly less. And one reason for that, besides biofuels and besides uh, waste, for example, it's also used as feed and from the difference plus the land area for the um, meadows and pastures, we wind up with only 400 kilocalories per capita a day. So in sum, we have roughly 2,000 and 800 kilocalories per capita a day globally on the global average. And again mentioned we have 2,200 square meters agricultural land for as, as arable land and permanent crops, that's where plants are grown directly. And for pastures and meadows that are used for animal production, we have double that actually. So this large area and significant amount of this difference are as used as feed wind up at only 500 kilocalories per capita a day. Well, and to give you some flavor of the problem we are running in, we can have a look at the situation and at the development of the situation. So we can simply assume that these numbers up here sort of represent what we can do globally. And so we look at what happens if we don't do anything, if we just let the system develop as it does and don't change our, our behavior, don't change anything. So this is again the status of today. We have just discussed that. These land areas, so, so much forest, I added that. This uh, is the nutritional value that we have a value, actually only the energy, not really a healthy diet, but just taking into account the energetic value of the food. 
This is the situation of today. And then we could look, can look ahead until the year 2050. And we know, we have learned that already, that there are three different UN scenarios taken into account that we can take into account the low variant, the medium variant and the high variant depending on the assumptions on how the fertility of the people will develop. The best situation we reach if we stick with the low scenario in 2050 then of course because we, have, we still are more people than we are today the agricultural land area has reduced, the forest region has reduced as well and the available kilocalories have reduced have been reduced significantly if we continue as we do today. In the medium variant we wind up at only a little bit more than 2000 kilocalories and if we even reach the high variant we do not even have 2000 kilocalories per capita in day. And I have shown previously that it is to be assumed that reality will wind up somewhere in between here which means more or less one-third less nutritional energy available. And this is of course dramatic. That calls for a significant change. And this also means that there is no way that bioenergy can be a significant contribution for energy supply if we don't change anything about our nutritional habits and things like that. So let's look how the individual contributions to these Food for the, to the food production, how they change. One thing is, of course, the overall land area. Does that change? Some people claim it's reduced, it's being reduced in the last years. Some people say, well, it's not that bad. If you look at the real numbers, then these are the values. The land area in million square kilometers, the arable land and permanent crops, that's actually more or less constant, very, very slightly increasing in the last decades. The uh, pastures and permanent meadows, that value is slightly decreasing, that meaning this difference is, uh, or this value is slightly decreasing. So the overall entire the sum of this and that is more or less constant throughout the last uh, 20 years. That is, we can assume that this value extrapolates also more or less as a constant value into the future, at least for the next few decades. So this is constant, luckily. It doesn't change dramatically. Secondly, we can have a look at the land productivity. How many calories do we produce per land area? If you look at that, it's the annual increase in the, in the energetical uh, productivity of the land area. And this is now for the overall land area, not per capita. Not per capita because we would have to divide by ever increasing number of people. We don't want that. I want to have a look at the overall productivity. So I take the overall land area times the per area productivity with respect to kilocalories. And by that, I'm then able to really say how that number increases annually. And we see it increases annually quite considerably. Actually, in the 1960s, it started at roughly 3% per year increase of overall fertility of the land area. And now we wind up at a rate of about 1.5% annually, that the overall fertility of the land area is increasing. We nevertheless see that the increase, the annual increase of land fertility is decreasing continually. It has been decreasing by 1.5% during the last 50 years, which is quite significant. And we can now go ahead and say, well, we take this green line and take that as the behavior of the system and try to or, or then extrapolate in that into the future. So, so the next calculations I show will actually be based on this green line. That is, the fertility of the land area is still increasing currently by roughly 1.5 percent. But that increase, this annual increase, is decreasing with time until sometime in another 50 years we will wind up at the zero. Uh, growth rate of land area fertility. Okay, this is an assumption we make. I should say actually it's not that bad and I will argue what actually is all included in here. This still means a certain continuity in our behavior because these are the real numbers including everything that happened in the past. If we look on the other hand side at the productivity of the land area with respect to the primary crop crops that are produced. That is, we have 
uh, arable land and permanent crops. We grow them, produce calories from that and evaluate how many calories we produce there. This is the curve, again, not or now evaluated as kilocalories per square meter and year. So something of the order of 200 and something and that has been increasing during the last years to uh, more than 600 kilocalories per square meter and year. So this is ever increasing. It increases by roughly 8 kilocalories per square meter and year. So every year 8 more kilocalories per square meter. So this is continuous increase. Why did we see that the, decree, that the increase was decreasing over time in the last slide? Well actually that is so because on the one hand side there are other utilizations of biomass that have been increasing since roughly 1980. Somewhere at that time it started that biomass was significantly used for other purposes. And also we have seen already that the production of meat is rather inefficient. And actually the animal-based products, they have been increasing during the last years. And we can see that again here. Uh, for different nations we have seen that for example in Germany, Austria there was a maximum during the last decades. It decreases now or decreased in Germany, it decreased around 1990. In Austria it decreased roughly around a little bit after 2000. And now all these nations here on a similar level, United States, Germany and Austria, the world average has actually been increasing throughout these 50 years and we see reasons for that. Big nations like in India, this contribution of animal-based calories for the, for the nutrition is ever increasing, very slightly only. In China, where the development boomed during the last decades, this meat or animal-based calories production is increased. That's actually the demand, so to speak, that is of course satisfied by the production. That increased significantly and that leads to this world average increase in animal-based calories production. This decreases the efficiency of the overall fertility of the, uh, the, of the land area to, to calories production. So there are fewer calories produced, relatively fewer calories produced if more animal-based products are uh, generated. And this leads actually to the reduction I have shown two slides ago. So the fertility of the land area is increasing but because we are using things for bioenergy to a certain extent already today because we are converting more of that to inefficiently converting that to animal based products the increase in the fertility at the end user consumption product so to speak that is decreasing over time and that's what describes how our system behaves as an engineer I would take this last value and would try to extrapolate that into the future now if we do so and use the different population scenarios of the United Nations, we wind up with such a diagram. This is the historical values of the nutritional, nutrition in kilocalories per capita and day. We have seen these numbers already around 2800 today. And we see if we stick with the low scenario, the calorie uh, production will be increasing if we continue as mentioned before. In the mean scenario it will be increasing until in roughly uh, 20 years and then will, it will be start to decrease. Actually the increase here is not so very significant. It's 2950 or so at its maximum. So not so many more calories than we have available today. And then it will be start decreasing because uh, then the annual increase in land area fertility does not change anymore. Uh, significantly and also the world population is then, then still slightly growing in this, uh, this time period. If on the other hand side we stick with a high population scenario, land area will essentially start decreasing today. Actually we are already here, we are at the maximum. Actually the last data available for these nutrition, nutritional um, aspects they end in the year 2009 and this is the last value included here. Today we are at 2014 as I recall this video. So there we predict with the highest scenario already a maximum in food supply. And as mentioned earlier in the series of presentations, it is very likely that we wind up somewhere between the medium and the high population scenario. So in between here, so 
it is not to be expected that we will have significantly more food available per capita if we continue more or less like we did in the past, even if land area fertility is significantly increasing also in the future. Okay, of course we have seen that there are significant variables that actually can be changed. Well, on the one hand side I should summarize that already a little bit. You see, the problem is not necessarily the food. We would have enough food, but actually we are too many people. So the too many people is really the problem. On the other hand side, we have seen that we made certain assumptions that we continue, so to speak, into the future especially the large fraction of animal-based food. If that is still increasing, and if that stays as high as it is today, then things like that will happen. And this means, again, no way to use bioenergy to a significant fraction. It's simply not possible, because it always means that more people are starving. And people, one should also say that clearly, are starving today. It's not a problem of the future, people are starving today. And even though that we have more than 2,800 kilocalories available on the global average, the distribution is un so uneven that there are people significantly less, with significantly less than 2,000 kilocalories per day, globally speaking. Millions of people, actually. So, what can we do about that? Well, we can refrain from eating animal-based products. Instead, using the land area for directly for crops production that we can eat and perhaps use the rest then for well, bioenergy. We can think about that if we first supply enough food to the people and then use the rest land area to use to, as, uh, to, for the bioenergy production. Now, how much land area do we need actually for a good food supply, for a healthy diet? We discussed that already earlier in the topic where we are today. And there we have seen that actually, just based on caloric data, we would need roughly one square meter per capita and per day, meaning 365 square meters for everybody of us would be sufficient just for the caloric values. Now, actually, you and I, we don't just want to eat corn, tomatoes and wheat or rice, but we would like to have also some vegetables, some fruits in between. Yeah? So, I assumed that we need 1,500 square meters per capita and year to supply healthy diet. And this also takes into account that the fertility of land area is different in different regions. So there is a different average value, so to speak, taken. And if you account now for that, what we can do is, if you look at the situation today, then we need per capita 1,500 square meters for the healthy food production. The rest, the 400, 550 square meters that we today are using as pasture, in part also as arable land, these we can use for the production of biomass for utilization in an energe in, in, in energetic way. And if I assume that we are used today's technology, biogas production, for example, I wind up at an efficiency of 2.5 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. This where numbers like this are highly debated in the literature. Depending on what you do, biodiesel, um, biogas or whatever, um, you find different values in the literature. 2.5 appears to be a sort of a reasonable value. If you assume that, you wind up with 13,850 kilowatt hours per year on the global average. That's not so bad. What was the overall consumption? 20,500. Meaning two-thirds of en our energy demand today could be supplied by bio, by bioenergy if we would refrain from eating anim animal products. Isn't that a perspective? Well, I guess it is. If we project then the situation to the year 2050 with increasing world population, it decreasing available land area per capita, it decreases proportional to the increase in world population. If we still assume that we need 1,500 square meters per capita and year, that means, or actually not per year, but overall, we see that there, are still, that there are still significant land area available, land area that we today use agriculturally. So it's no new agricultural land, it's just the land that we have today. Only we take 1,500 for direct crops production, vegetables and whatever productions, 
and the rest is then used to produce bioenergy. And if they look, it still is a significant amount, even in the high scenario, the high population scenario, almost 8,000 kilowatt hours per year are available, which corresponds to roughly, well, a fourth or so of the, uh, the, the no, a third of what we need today. This was half or uh, two thirds of what we use today, and this is uh, still roughly one, a little bit more than one third of what we use today. Now, of until 2050, the per capita energy consumption incre will increase because of the average development of the people. So this will be only a third to a fourth, but still a significant amount. It's not, it's non-zero. We don't see any principal limits in that if we use biomass on somewhere this um, level. We have seen that reality will wind up somewhere between medium and high, so something of this order, order would be possible. Of course, here this is not really correct. It's not correct because it assumes that the fertility of the land area, of that land area, land area that is pastures and permanent meadows today is as good as for the other agricultural land, and that's not, not true, of course. So it will be significantly less, but nevertheless, the contribution will be significant, even if the produ productivity will be a little bit less than shown here. This shows, again, that if we refrain from eating animal products, we have the chance to contribute a significant amount uh, of energy based on biomass. Now, one should clearly say that, of course, this also means that there is a shift in trading systems, globally speaking. Um, but first of all, I would give, like to give these numbers for the uh, sun productivity because I, before I then show the global map on how things distribute. Solar radiation in Germany, it took this value because it's a representative value also for the biomass production. It's of the order of 1000 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. If we produce biodiesel, there are different European studies that show that this value may be somewhat correct. 1.5 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. Biogas production of the order of 2.5 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. Then the idea of biomass conversion into liquid with special chemical engineering processes. It's hoped that we can reach 3 kilowatt hours per square meter and year on a pilot plant scale or even industrial level. But if we use photovoltaics, we are significantly higher of the order of 100 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. And this is actually a number that accounts for the energy we need to produce the solar panels. So this has already been subtracted. So this is really the net, net gain from photovoltaics today. And we see directly that using photovoltaics for electricity production is much more efficient than using any of these biomass technologies. So electricity is the best way produced by photovoltaics. Thermal energy very often is also more efficiently produced by the solar thermal panels and not by first going through bioenergy. For bioenergy we can use that for fuels, where we need a high energy density that we can put into a tank somewhere. We can't use electricity into a tank. That's still today very tedious, very complicated, not such a high density. Yeah, so these things will be for fuels, this will be for electricity and heat we can use with uh, thermal solar panels. But now I wanted to show you something about the worldwide distribution of bioenergy. And there are studies on that. Uh, this is from uh, well, some organization of the German um, government, so to speak, that they are uh, experts collecting information and reporting that to the German government. And they came up with a map on the bioenergy potentials in gigajoule per hectare and year. The color scale is shown here. It's not shown for all years, but just for some locations where that has been evaluated. Blue is rather negative, yellow to red, is positive and green is somewhere in between. And actually we see a very specific distribution. We see, for example, red and yellowish dots and some green dots here in Malaysia. We see no chance in, in uh, India, so to speak. Slight chances here in China, slight chances also Europe and United States. Here are some red dots in between scattered. The light reds, there are no data are more or less really reliably available, but all, and the situation is not so stable. So here we see a range of blue, so not efficient 
but here we see some efficient data. Down here we see some efficient um, data pot points. And interestingly enough, these regions are completely different from those that supply energy today. So energy is supplied today some from somewhere in North, uh, North Africa, Russia. So this is the region that supplies energy today. Completely different nations that might be supplying nutrition and energy tomorrow. Yeah? What does that mean for our trading systems? Interesting questions. Okay, having shown this, I would like to summarize this next uh, topic. I've shown that nutrition is not a problem of the future. One should stress it like that, but it's a problem today. Our nutritional value that we produce is unevenly distributed across the, wor the world and it's scarce in significant areas, worldwide speaking. So we have to solve this problem not in the future, but we actually should be hard working to solve it today. The problem is that on the one hand side we have a sumptuous living, on the other hand side people are hungry, people are starving. I have also shown that if we continue as we did in the past, bioenergy is not an appreciable option. It can contribute nothing essentially, only if we change our habits, and that's something very important actually. Changing habits, you will see that later on as well, changing habits may change something. If we don't eat so much animal-based products, we have good chances to even use significant amounts of bioenergy for our energy supply on sustainable levels. But this actually I did not, it's not a summary, but it's actually a new point I didn't mention before. If we don't want to use fossil resources for our materials production, then we need biomass for that, for plastics, for example, yeah? for cleansing and uh, detergents, everything like all those things. When the, actually, there's biomass used to a significant um, extent already today, but all the polymers, the plastics and all these things, we can only produce them from biomass if we don't have crude oil available to the extent as we have it today. So here we simply have to stick with the best option available, which is biomass. And if I now argue against bioenergy, one should not misunderstand that. I, the only chance to uh, produce materials on a sustainable way, and this can be done on a limited land area, I, it's a different discussion, I don't want to go into that detail so much here, it can be done sustainably if you do it on biomass. Actually we estimated that something in the range between 300 and 500 square meters per capita in, uh, would be required, which is less than 10%, significantly less than 10% of the overall land area, but to produce as much plastics as we produce already today. If we would reduce that a little bit more, then it's even more efficient than that. So now let's come to the next topic. We have discussed this land area, bioenergy, nutrition. Which options do we have for sustainable energy supply? Well, finally, in the end, we should look at the definition of sustainability and try to understand a little bit. And this has very nicely been summarized in the Bundland report, Our Common Future, which was published in 1987. It was, uh, well, the commission was headed by Grohal and Bundland, a Norwegian uh, politician at that time. Uh, she has been prime minister to Norway for extended periods of time and uh, as I said it was signed on March 20th, 1987 and here sustainability is very nicely summarized in one sentence actually. And actually it has been, is been formulated in a very positive way. Humanity has the ability to make development sustainable to ensure that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future gener generations to meet their own needs. And that actually defines sustainability and nevertheless expresses a positive perspective on that. So meeting today's needs without compromising future needs. That's more or less sustainability. The question is now which alternatives do we have to produce energy or to actually to, to use energy on a sustainable level. Different options are possible that are discussed. Nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, fossil with carbon capture and sequestration, fossil energy carriers and using this carbon capture and sequestration. That means 
producing CO2, but then collecting all the CO2 and putting it somewhere into the ground. Well, this is not really sustainable. These nuclear things, even fusion, are not sustainable as well because you always produce nuclear waste. Nuclear fission, in nuclear fusion, that's not so much, but especially in nuclear fission, it's like gigantic amounts. And what can happen with that, we have seen already in the past. Because the problem, well, a significant amount of the problems in Fukushima, for example, was not the active parts, but what was it was what was cooling down. That was waste already, so to speak. So we have to stick with nuclear waste in these two options, which means it's not sustainable. We can discuss that for hours if we like. I don't want to do that now. Then you can have wave or tidal power plants, hydropower, which is significantly used already today, wind energy also being significantly used, geothermal energy and biomass. Geothermal energy is limited to, limited to certain regions where the ground is hot enough. In biomass we have discussed already, it only makes sense using waste biomass, things that really are supplied as waste. Some part of the plants are used for food. Some other plants cannot be used. You can produce bioenergy from that, if you like. And then you have these last two points, solar thermal power plants and photovoltaics. These two actually are able to well, contribute significant amounts to the energy consumption that we have. Also, well, actually, if you look at the others, these are the very prominent. They can, each of them can supply 100%, if you like, if you put them in the proper locations. Others can contribute significant contributions, but they are still limited. Wind energy will not be able to supply everything. Hydropower also significant amounts, but not all of it. These two have, in principle, the chance to supply all the energy that we need. At least just comparing the numbers. So we are left with quite a number of options. And the question is, why don't we use them today if they are so positive? Now let's look at what may be difficult about them. Well, first of all, they are technically possible. This is, for example, a solar thermal power plant. It's Andersol in South Spain. You see the, the mirrors here that collect the solar energy into a fluid that is pumped through a transparent tube and with that heated fluid, then uh, the power plant process is driven, so electricity is being produced. This Andersol also has a certain energy storage system so that it can also run during nighttime. In these big tanks, uh, molten salts are um, collected. They are actually heated up and this heat stored in these molten salts then can be used during nighttime to run the power plant process. So you have continuous electricity production throughout the day, if sun is shining during daytime, of course. Now, what is the problem with that? So this is possible, photovoltaics, you know from many roofs around, perhaps, that uh, that's possible as well. The problem is the price. The uh, production for cost for electricity are given now in euro per kilowatt hours, and this is just a comparison. Don't take the numbers on this euro cent exact, but they give you orders of magnitude. Small devices for photovoltaics, the price is around 15 euro cent per kilowatt hours. Uh, if you run that in an open field, many photovoltaic cells, that's in Germany, that can be slightly reduced. If you run that in Spain, again open field, large areas, it is still smaller the price because of the higher solar radiation there. So it, that means that your benefit is higher and you, the investment costs are um, better distributed uh, per kilowatt hour, so to speak. Onshore wind energy is relatively cheap. Offshore wind energy is relatively ex ex import, uh, expensive. Actually, the onshore wind energy is in the order of the price that we pay for electricity from fossil resources today. Five euro cent of the order of that. And solar thermal energy in Spain is still a little bit too expensive as compared to what we are willing to pay for electricity, for example, today. Now the question is, can we extrapolate these numbers somehow into the future? We always try to make project projections into the future. Can we also do this with these numbers in some sensible way? 
If one wants to do that, one uses so-called learning curves. Well, it's coming from economics. People there use learning curves to describe how prices behave into the future. They try to extrapolate price development into the future. It constitutes an exponential relation between the cost and the accumulated market. Accumulated market meaning accumulating all that has been produced and sold. That is, all for photovoltaic modules, for example, that have been produced and sold. That is the so-called accumulated market. And now the exponential re relation looks like that. The price versus the price as a sum starting time equals 1 plus this accumulated market divided by the accumulated market at the starting time. So there has to be some history before that already to the power of the minus the learning factor. This learning factor is minus LR. So we just look how much how many solar panels have been sold at uh, have been so sold at a certain time what was their price we determine this uh, learning factor from historical data and then extrapolate that into the future the price as a function of the accumulated market in the future and then we see how the price will decrease this is actually decreasing we're predicting that the price will decrease the price is decreasing because the production of let's stick with the example photovoltaic cells will get more efficient, you will use less energy to produce them. Also the photovoltaics technology itself will improve, so to uh, produce one, say, a kilowatt uh, photovoltaic cell, you need lesser material, you will be more efficient to produce them, and that is all represented by this learning factor. Now let's look how that behaves. If you plot the historical data, this is shown here, the price for photovoltaic modules in euro, it's actually inflation corrected euros in 2012 per watts peak for the photovoltaic cells. You always define their size or their productivity in watts peak, meaning if you have full sunlight, this, is, this would be the watts. Now there are clouds around in nighttime, then you don't get that. But in principle, in full sunlight, this is the value with which it, that is calculated. So this is the price per this watt peak. And you see that it was of the order of uh, 20 uh, euro in 1980, and that has dropped until now. This is somewhere now of the order of uh, around 1 euro per watt peak. And this is a cumulated production in gigawatts. We know giga, 10 to the 9 watts peak, of course, and you see here how much photovoltaics has been produced during, in the meantime. 1980, 1990, 2000, and 2010, we see, and we directly see if we stick with the green line that somehow smooths the overall behavior, we see that the price has continually been decreasing as more and more photovoltaics modules have been produced. And we see a 20% price reduction if the installed power is doubled, meaning the more we produce, the cheaper it will get. And this is actually one reason why it is good to have say tax reductions or whatever if you install solar panels because that increases the installed power which decreases the price and makes solar energy more competitive. So there is a certain political trick to support solar power that will make solar power significantly cheaper. We have done similar simulations and have done this for photovoltaics as well as for solar thermal power plants and came up with such a projection. We see this for the photovoltaics and for the solar thermal power uh, plants. These values have been, uh, well, there's a certain spread in the learning factor from the historical data, so there are, is a certain width in each of these scenarios. So we see that the electricity cost will drop to less than 10 euro cent, so this is a euro per kilowatt hours, and this is 10 euro cent, so to speak, it will drop below 10 euro cent in, say, roughly 10 years from now. Well, keeping in mind that there's a certain width of this distribution. On the other hand side, we have seen that the price for fossil energy carriers was increasing, at least for crude oil, was increasing by 12% annually, meaning that it will be decreasing faster than these 10%, which means that Within five to 10 years, roughly speaking, the price for these fossil energy carriers will be 
more expensive than producing energy directly from sunlight. So here is a certain break-even. Of course, this situation of the break-even, the competition between two different energy carriers, or actually three, photovoltaics, solar thermal, and fossil resources, this competition cannot be described with, with this simple approach. We only see that in that case fossil energy carriers are, as, are becoming as expensive as solar energy. And actually the point is not that the solar energy is getting so significantly cheaper, but actually the fossil resources, fossil resources are getting more, uh, more expensive. And that's why these curves intersect and that's why somewhere in this range it is to be expected that fossil energies will be used less because solar energy is getting so cheap that it is competitive. The nice thing about, about that is we said that if we manage within 10 to 20 years to reduce our CO2 emissions drastically, we have good chances to avoid hitting the plus 2 degrees centigrade limit in the climate. And if you look at the time scales, 10 years from now is here, and there we see even if the fossil energy carriers will only increase overall by 5%, that will be competitive, or the, the solar energy will be competitive to these fossil resources. Meaning, we have good chances within 10 or 20 years to really avoid hitting the plus 2 degree centigrade limit. So this is very positive. There are good chances to manage that. And nevertheless, we don't use bioenergy. Bioenergy will more or less be only an intermediate scenario, so to speak, for the next perhaps 20 years, and then we will use only waste biomass, no rapeseed, uh, no, no rapeseed oil, for example, no sugar alcohol, or whatever. Some nations may still use it, but on the global scale, that appears to be counterproductive concerning food production. With that, I've given you hopefully a slightly positive perspective into the future. Nevertheless, it becomes clear that I didn't say anything against the crowdedness of the Earth. Earth will be crowded at that time. Nutrition will be difficult. And even to supply only enough food will need to, well, behavior, will need behavioral changes. With that, I would like to summarize this point before I then in the next video come to the conclusions. We should promote and support solar energy to make it cheaper. I have discussed that with the learning curves. The break even between fossil energy carriers and solar energy is possible even within a few years, say 10 to 20 years, before we hit the plastic two, uh, 2 degree centigrade limit. And of course, as I said, how the system behaves if there's a strong competition between fossil resources and solar energy, we don't know. And so the fate of the fossil energy carriers in that period of time still remains open. So, for example, I can tell you that refineries had difficulties in the last economic crisis, 2008, because the production rate dropped so much that their processes became very inefficient and actually the production costs were increasing per liter of produced gasoline significantly and that was really a big problem to the refineries. And if that should, of course, be in effect taking place globally, fewer fossil resources being used, this economy of scale that is usually applied for the big, well, fossil energy carrier production plants, uh, they will have uh, problems. So we don't know what will happen then, so it is a very complicated situation in which we are running concerning economics on that end. So with that I would like to finish this video. We discussed land area, bioenergy, nutrition and the options for sustainable energy supply. I've shown that energy is possible without hitting the plus degree centigrade limit. We only perhaps have to rethink one or the other thing and all those things I will then summarize in the last two chapters, actually one chapter and one slide for the conclusions that will be shown or which I will be dwelling on in the next presentation. This is it for now. I would be happy if you would join me also in the next, in the last video. Thank you very much.